I would like to call our apostle up, please. It's time for the message of the day. Yes, you can give Dad a, a clap. Hallelujah. They had a bit of a break last week. We're happy to have you and Mom back. And Dad is sharing on the process, which I believe is a very important message for all of us today. Thank you, Dad. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It is wonderful to be back. We missed you guys last week. It was strange not to be in church. We were in church with Pastor Jack in Durban, and we had some ministry on Saturday afternoon in Peter Maritzburg. But um, at home is home, and it's wonderful to be home, and it's wonderful to be here. And uh, we're excited about what God's doing. So, yes, I just want to join everybody in saying happy birthday to my wife. I love doing ministry with you. I love doing life with you. And it's wonderful to share the day with everybody here. Um, just a little bit of feedback about our little breakaway holiday. We went to Northern Natal after the weekend of ministry. We went up uh, to Huwe and Umfuluzi and up to Tembe Elephant Park and had lots of fun in the sandy roads. Uh, as mom called it, we were chased by elephants. Well, I said there was an elephant in our vicinity, not quite <laughs> chased, but um, we had a really great time together and it's wonderful to just now and again take a break and allow God to just speak again afresh and allow God to just reset the tiredness of this COVID year, the things so that we can have real courage for this last piece. But uh, yeah, you guys at a party this side with Evangelist Freddy as well. So yeah, I'm thankful that we are in a place where we can go away and things still go well here. Today I want to talk about the Christian process. A lot of Christians think that it's only about giving your life to Christ and that then they've done what they should do and they're going to heaven and they sort of like stop there. But today I want to talk about that that is the starting point. That is not the end point. Giving your life to Christ just means that you've moved over from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You've started your journey, but now you've got to walk into it. And like any sport, you cannot reach the highest level on day one. Connor, if you pitched up for primary school rugby practice for the first time, at what age, nine, ten years old, you start playing rugby, would there be a place in the Springbok team for you that week? <laughs> okay? What's going to happen to you if they put you into the Springbok team in that same week? You're going to get so hurt and so destroyed, you'll never touch a rugby ball again. There's a process of development. If be it racing, Formula One, you start by go-karts and you race that for a while, then something else, then Formula Four and move up and up, and eventually you get your license that allows you to ride Formula One. The fact that you might do well in a rally championship or do well in a, a go-kart race doesn't mean you can go challenge the Formula One. And even in your first year in Formula One, you're most probably not going to win. Even when you get an entry into the highest level, you still have to keep on developing. But the Church of God has stopped developing. I want to say, look at your own life and say, are your Christian walk the same place it was this year, last year? <laughs> it's got a bit quiet here. Are you still facing the same challenges? Are you still operating on the same level? Or have you allowed God to work you out to the next level? Let's go to our first scripture. Philippians 2 and verse 12 to 16. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much, much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
If your salvation was just a thing that you raised your hand one day in church, there's no fear and trembling and working out involved in that. Does that make sense? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. With other words, realizing that it has great value and that it is fragile and it is at risk. Because if you have to be fearful, not fearful as in scared all the time, but if you have to realize that it has value and you have to keep on working at it, and you have not arrived the day that you raised your hand in church or the day that you prayed in your bedroom and said, God, I give my life to you, you've only just started the race. And there's a whole process involved in going from there. And I want to say, church... How is your process going? How is your process going? Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless. Not that you are blameless and harmless, that you become. As you're doing things, as you are functioning in the church, something happens to your whole makeup to your personality, to who you are and what you are. Without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So our light will shine brighter and brighter as we go through the process of working out our salvation. So I want to talk today about a couple of areas that we need to allow the process to happen. And the first one, obviously, is your salvation. Keep on working at your salvation. Keep on working at what is the condition of your heart. What is the place that you're in regarding Christ? Um, If we think about Jacob, not putting up the scripture, but we all know this place, that after he left his dad's house, he was in the nighttime and he met with the angel and they wrestled the whole night about his future. They wrestled the whole night about where they were going to in Christ. So the problem is that churches and Christians have stopped wrestling with God the way that Jacob wrestled with God. We just allow things to happen to us and we might just carry on, but we've neglected the place where Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. He wrestled with God until his hip was out of its socket. In other words, it was so real that it was practically, there was a result, there was a scar, there was a limp that he walked with for the rest of his life because of that wrestling. But Christians, oh well, I'm serving God, I'm okay. I'm still doing the same stuff I did last year, but oh well. It's time to close your door, Christian. Get on your face before your God and say, okay, God, what must change? Can we say that loud together? What must change, God? (laughs) Start asking God to speak to you about what must change. So that we cannot stay the same. We cannot year after year face the same issues. It said, the first scripture that we read, it said, um, verse 14, Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless. So there's a becoming, there's a process, there's a working out of who God is in your life. And I see Christians grow and grow and grow, and then there's an area that they don't want to submit to God. There's an area that they don't want to hand over. And their working out in fear and trembling stops there until they can take that area to God as well. And say, God, how must this change? How must this adjust? What must be different in this process? What I did last year and the year before and the last 20 years of being a Christian is not good enough anymore. The second area is our sanctification. So the first area is work out your salvation. The second area is from 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. We are saved 
by a process of sanctification. Look there. God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation, a salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy and through your belief in there. Um, have you got that in the NIV version? Because it says there that there's a sanctifying work. There's a process that it happens in that scripture. You see, the church of God has started running after the gifts of the Spirit. In other words, we want to see healings and we want to see manifestations. And those are great things. But we can never, ever, ever neglect the process of sanctification. The process of saying, God, last year, last week, last month, I was there. Now I'm here. And let that be a continual process of sanctification. And uh, v- verse 14, he called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teaching we passed on to you, whether by word or mouth or by letter. Stand firm is a verb. It's something you have to do. It means that if you don't, you're going to fall over. If, if I'm saying to you, get ready, stand, then you're expecting something to come against you. If I'm telling you, get yourself, brace yourself, because you might get knocked over, it means there's a knock coming. In life, many knocks come at us. But Christians aren't ready for that. They haven't braced themselves. They haven't stood firm to allow the process of sanctification. They just want to go on lack of life. We, uh, we love Jesus. We sing nice songs on Sunday. But the rest of the time, we just, whatever happens to us happens. But God is calling the church and saying, allow me to do a sanctification work on you. Allow me to work on the process in your life. And do not stay the way you are. Don't stay where you are. Pursue more. So, this is my heart that I want to try and encourage us today. It's to saying, where am I in my journey with Christ? And what is the next step for me? How do I work out my next step? Can I just stay where I am? Am I comfortable where I am? Am I okay where I'm? Is where I am where God wants me? Because sometimes maybe our comfort will tell us we're okay where we are. Our risk of stepping up to the next level, we will immediately get more flack. We will immediately draw more attention. We will immediately challenge some people. We might lose some friends. We might lose some money. We might have to act on a certain way. And now the process comes in saying, do I want to go to the next level? Do I really want to allow God to work so much in my life? That that which was okay yesterday is not okay anymore today. A process of sanctification. So now we've spoken spiritually about sanctification and salvation. Do you understand the difference? The one is the salvation is about you are saved, you belong in the kingdom of God and you're going to heaven. The other one, sanctification, is right here on earth you are becoming more holy. Sin has less and less of a hold on you. There's supposed to be a change. There's supposed to be a constant moving closer and closer to the glory of God. Closer and closer to a place of pure and uh, holiness. Okay? So now we take it a bit practical. Healing. We have to grow in the area of faith surrounding healing. All of us has sickness come against you? If you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, sickness does come against you. Does that happen to anybody? Or am I the only one that sometimes has a runny nose or a cough or something come against me? But we have to grow in our faith in the area of healing. In the 80s, when they started preaching about healing, they thought it was only some people that had the healing gift and people drove thousands of kilometers to get to where the person with the anointing for healing was and church didn't understand 
that everybody can operate in the level of healing, both for themselves and for praying for others. But it's a process to grow there. You cannot have the same level of faith that you had last year, this year. You have to grow. Let's look at a scripture quickly. Jesus' disciples prayed for somebody and he didn't get better. Matthew 17 verse 20. And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, that is your lack of firmly relying or trusting, for truly I say to you, if you have faith that is a living, like a grain of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to yonder place, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Then verse 21, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So there was somebody that was ill. The disciples prayed for him. He didn't get ill. And God says, it's your fault. <clears throat> hey, sorry, Lord. We tried. We laid our hands on him. We made him try and made him walk up and down, but he was still stuck in the wheelchair. We dragged him up and down here by his ears, but he's not walking. God says, it's your fault. You haven't grown your faith. You haven't pursued me to truly understand living faith to the level of being able to see that thing come free. It comes free by fasting and prayer. Verse 21, by fasting and prayer. So there's something that you must pursue. There's something that you must push in for. There's something you have to trust God for. There's something that you have to, in your closed door, Alone with God, say, God, increase the anointing on my life. Lord, teach me how to deal with this. Father, I even won't eat today because I want to hear your voice about this thing. I want to pray for somebody in this area, but I need more than what I've had before. Last Sunday, I was there with Dad, and we prayed for somebody, and it didn't work. I need more, Lord God. Not stop doing it because that's what happened with the church now. The church says, okay, well, it didn't work last week, so now I'm not going to do it. Uh, last week, we tried to speak to somebody with cancer, and they didn't get healed. We tried to get somebody out of a wheelchair, and they didn't get healed. So now, no, we better not pray for anybody in church, because just now we embarrass ourselves. Isn't that true? What do we have to do? We have to practice our faith. And we have to push in more with prayer. And the church as a whole, not only the pastors, has got to say, God, give us the anointing to change this. Let the power of God flow. Let us the faith as a church as a whole to see the miracles happening. And that also applies in your own life. You have to have greater and greater levels of faith to pray for yourself. You have to say, I have to work out my healing in the same way that I'm working out my salvation. I have to work out my spiritual healing that we've already dealt with in the same way I have to work out my natural healing. Saying, God, what must change? What do I do here? How do I approach this? For me, God has said to me, if you want to be healthy, you better lose some weight. That was a very simple instruction. It wasn't going to the Bible and getting somebody to lay hands on me three times and pour some holy water on me or do anything. It just said, lose some weight. Hey, no. Okay? Simple. So you have to hear what God is saying about your health. And it might be practical or it might be spiritual, but you better listen. You better be in a place where you're saying, I can respond to what God is saying because I want to develop in the natural, the healing, in the same way that I'm developing in the spiritual side. Okay. I'm pursuing that process. Oh. Am I stepping on some toes here? <laughs> Am I challenging you a little bit? I'm challenging myself. I'm saying, oh, you know, I better... Get some things in place. Now let's talk about finance. <laughs> exactly the same principle applies. Pastor Wendy, thank you. Incredible word about finance. But we have to practice our financial muscles the same way we practice our spiritual muscles. As a Christian, you have to keep on growing in every area. 
How can you say that? Well, you th have you seen the Jabez prayer that is in the Bible? Where God says, enlarge your tents, get ready for more. Whenever he spoke to any of the patriarchs, he said, I'm going to bless you more than what you can imagine. Not, none of them started out with everything. Jacob left his dad with nothing. And he went to a place and he came back with much. There was a process happening in the financial realm. There was a process happening that were changing things in this area. And you have to practice it just as much as what you have to get on the machine and do some exercises or lift some weights or something to get rid of the stomach. So you have to say, I'm going to practice my financial things. I'm going to sow and believe God for an increase again and again and again. So many people has tried it for once or twice and it didn't work and then they give up. But again, I come back to sport. It's the best example that you can have. If you go to the practice once or twice and they don't choose you for the first team, is it going to be right if you just stay at home? You have to keep on practicing. You have to keep on trying. It's not something that happens in a week or two. It's not something that happens in a day or two. It is something that happens through huge dedication. And some days you're going to hate pr the practice. Some days you're going to hate what the coach makes you do. And it's going to cost you. It's not, you're never going to reach the first team while staying in your comfort zone on your couch playing TV games. You're going to have to get off the couch and go run around the field field and up and down the pavilion and kick the ball and take some knocks. Does that make sense? That there's a process that you have to work out. And sometimes you're going to go into a game that is beyond your ability and you're going to get taken out totally by some guy double your size and double your speed that's just going to make you feel like, why am I even playing? I should just stay at home. But if you're going to reach that senior place and that Springbok place and the national team, you have to get up from that knock. You have to, Sunday morning with your sore body, get back in the gym, get start again, and push harder than ever before. But Christians take one knock in any of these areas that I've mentioned, including finances. Oh, well, tithing doesn't work. Oh, well... <laughs> This hurts too much. Last month, I ran out of money before the end of the month came. If I never tithed, I might have got there. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, I know the feeling so well. If I have an issue to pay, and I think, look at what I have given. What could I have done with that? And Satan will tell you, you would have been better off if you never gave. And he comes at you at the moment when it's hard, at the moment when it's challenging, at the moment when you're trying to figure out how do I get to the next place. But you have to learn to shut him up and say to him, Satan, God has said give and it will be given and I'm going to keep on giving because God's word is higher than the thoughts that are coming up during my crisis. God's word is higher than the thoughts that come up during my crisis. Let's just read one scripture for that. I can do lots, but let's just do one. Mark 4 and verse 20, my favorite scripture at the moment. It's the seed is sown, and they speak a lot about all the seeds that were sown in many places. But in verse 20, others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, and some 100 times what was sown. When you sow, you are expecting a return. You are expecting a breakthrough. You're expecting things to shift. And a farmer will always want most of his seed to fall on the good soil. Some will fall on the paths and some will get eaten by the birds and others will be on the rocky stuff that has no root. But some of it is going to produce fruit. Don't give up because some didn't produce fruit. Don't give up because some didn't work. Keep on believing. Keep on sowing. Keep on expecting God to do something more than what you have seen before. 
But, Pastor, why are you telling us about finances? We're in church. We want to talk about holiness. People work five, six, seven days a week, eight to ten, twelve hours a day for money. And then they want to come to us at church and say, no, we mustn't talk about money. Imagine if the Word of God can make your eight, nine, ten, hour, twelve hours a day more productive, put the favor of God onto it so that it can produce fruit that you can work less. Okay? But you need to understand that effort alone won't get you there. Effort alone won't get you there. It's got to be effort with the favor of God, with the faith of God, with the same things I said about every other part of the process. Finances has the same thing. The fifth thing that you have to grow in is influence. You cannot have the same amount of influence as what you had last year for this year. Why must it grow? Because, like Kenneth Dean said to us, we are called by God to have an impact. We are called by God to set the captives free. We are called by God to bring good news to the poor. But it cannot be just the same select little group year after year after year. It has to increase. It has to grow to the next place. And you have to believe God for that growth in your influence. Scripture for that will be 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 15. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand. As your faith grows, there's an immediate result of your sphere of activity, which is your sphere of influence, increases. It is just absolutely natural. And you have to believe, let's say you learn the key on health in what we've just gone through before earth, that God will increase your influence so that you can bring it to others. If you have the breakthrough on how to work on your sanctification, how to deal with blatant sin in your life, you can share it with others and help them to do the same thing. If you have working out your salvation, the testimonies we hear here is often about I got this finances or I got healed of this thing. And those are beautiful. But the true testimony is that I thought I'm going to give up on Christ. I had such a struggle. I, this hurt me and that disappointed me. And the pastor did that wrong and I was going to run away. But the power of God came. The power of God came and met me at my place of true need. Because that is our greatest need. That's greater than finances. It's greater than uh, healing. It's greater than anything. That place where you again realize, I've got to move my life back into alignment with God. That is the testimonies that I want to hear here. I heard that Michael did such a great one last week. But how he encountered God at a difficult time in your life. I don't want to pick on you, but... It's now the testimony that's fresh in our hearts. You came up last week and saying, I was battling. And God puts a video on my path that just made me understand why I'm battling. And that's the love of Christ. That's the part perfectly how God reaches out to us. He sends something on our path on the days that we're battling. Doesn't matter what we're battling with. Doesn't matter what we're going through. Doesn't matter what it's based on. God wants to touch you in your place of need and take you on a process of healing, of wholeness, of taking you to the next level, taking you, expanding your influence as he's expanding you in every other area, as he is taking you in every area onto another realm, onto another place where you've got to go and say, God, I can't stay where I'm at. I've been stuck here for years. I've not been able to get there. I've had the sickness for how long? Can I tell you a little bit about my battle with illness? I have one of the things I battle with is sleep apnea. So I get a machine that I sleep with, and when I sleep with that, I have no issue with sleep apnea. 
long as I have my machine, me and my sleep apnea are friends. It doesn't bother me. Then a night like last night comes out where there's no power. Okay, 11 o'clock, praying. Lord, please let the power go on so that I can put my machine on. 12 o'clock, Lord, please, I need some sleep. I must preach tomorrow morning. Let the power come on. 1 o'clock, the same prayer. 2 o'clock, the same prayer. Lord, my alarm is set for 5 o'clock. It's now running towards 3 o'clock. I need to have some sleep, Lord. And he says, change your prayer. Lord, what must I change? Trust me for sleep without your machine. But I haven't trusted you for that for so many years, God, because I'm comfortable with my machine. I'm comfortable in my place of illness because I've learned how to deal with it. I don't really need healing because I've got a machine. And this is what happens to us all is that we are not any more fighting because we learn how to deal with our illness, how to manage it, how to eat right and sleep with the machine and stay away from this and stay away from that. And in the end, we are just so boxed in. And I'm not saying don't do all those things. I'm saying let's trust God for freedom that is complete freedom. I slept a few hours without the machine. The power never came on. And I realized that, hey, I can. <laughs> First time in I don't know how long. And this is the process that we have to say, I cannot indulge my illness. That's the word I want to use. We indulge it because we've learned how to manage around it. We've learned how to live with it. And God says, I want to totally set you free. I don't do half jobs. I don't make plans around your illness. I want to deal with it and totally bring you freedom. Yes, I have to, like I say, lose weight and do some practical things for my healing to work out. But I have to, at the same time, also operate in faith again and again for healing. I can never, ever get comfortable in a place of illness. I can never get comfortable in a place of financial struggling. I can never get comfortable in a place of not being free from sin. I can never be comfortable in a place where my salvation isn't sorted and I'm confident that I am right, right standing with God because I'm consistently working it out in fear and trembling. I'm consistently figuring out what God is doing. So my challenge to us as church is to say, there is a process. It is not just we have arrived. You are in a process. And your effort that you put into the process is directly related to what you get out. Because God didn't say to the disciples, well, it's impossible for you to cast these out. He said, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So in other words, he says you can do something about the things that you're not getting right. You can pray. You can fast. You can pursue him on such a place until it works. Until it works. Until you get the breakthrough. But the church has got lazy in paying the price. And by the church, I include myself. We've got lazy in paying the price for breakthrough. We've said, okay, I can handle this. I can manage this place. I can make sure it doesn't grow any further. But as long as I can have, my, for me, my machine and this and that, then I don't have to get healing. Because I can have it. I can survive. I've made a plan how to get past it. And I'm not saying <laughs> don't use the medical stuff. But I'm saying don't get comfortable in a place where you're going around. Keep on pursuing God for that healing because he wants to heal you completely. Not just halfway, not just a little bit. It is absolutely all he has for you. Put up for me uh, 2 Kings 
13 and verse 18. <laughs> Did it go off? Oh, the power put it off. Okay. Um, pass me my cell phone. I don't have it here. My cell phone there. Is it on? There we go. All right. Thank you. This is the process where the king and the prophet is speaking, and the prophet is giving an instruction about the process to the king. And he said, take the arrows, and the king took them. And Elisha told him, strike the ground. And he struck it three times and stopped. Drummer, Nathan, can you quickly get on the drum for me, please? Is the drum going to work now? Do we have sound? I need just three loud knocks on the drum, please. So he said, take the arrows, and the king took them. And Elisha told him, strike the ground three times. And he stuck it three times. Sorry, buddy. Okay. And this is the problem that most of us do when God gives us an instruction. We give three ones of those. Can you make with a bass drum for me three, please? Yes. Okay. We do just those three. Can you hear that there's not really power in that? There's not really conviction in what God wants to do. When God gives us an instruction, He's expecting us to go crazy. He's expecting us to strike the ground many times. Go to the next verse. And the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram, completely destroyed him. But now you will defeat it only three times. This is the problem with the church. We half-hearted go after the things of God, and then when it doesn't work, we blame God. We do three little taps. But where can I sit? But now I want you to go completely mad for at least a whole minute. As much noise as what you can possibly get out of this system. <laughs> I'd like you all to stand for me, please. Get something that you can hit. Not your wife or your husband, but something that you can hit. Let's make a noise. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. What are you making a noise for? If you're just making a noise without a reason, it's a waste of time. But what are you believing God for? I'm believing God for a healing in my family. I'm believing God for finances, for breakthrough. I'm believing God for ministries international to open up. I'm believing God for things to come right that I've been working at for many, many years. Let's make a noise, church, and be believing God. Say to God, what are you believing Him for? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You see, because of time limit now, we'll stop it. But what God requires of us is not three little taps, not three little tries at the things that we need to challenge. God is expecting us to push in supernaturally and saying, I'm going to keep on hitting the ground until I see the breakthrough. I'm going to keep on pushing in even when it hurts, even when I'm tired, even when I'm bruised, even when it didn't work. I'm going to keep on pushing because I'm understanding that the Christian walk is a process. The Christian walk is a process of developing and growth and influence increasing. And I'm going to pursue my salvation with fear and trembling. I'm not going to give up the moment it gets hard. I'm not going to give up the moment I'm uncomfortable. I'm not going to give up the moment I don't see the results. I'm going to push in because the Word of God has said it, and that's what I'm going to base it on. Are we going to close with the song, worship team? Connor, will you take away from me? The pulpit. I want you to think about your process. I spoke about many areas today. 
but there might be just one area that is for you a challenge. I don't know what is your area where your process is stuck. I don't know what is your area where you know God wants to move you forward, but you're not seeing that breakthrough. As we sing now again, I want you to just say, God, I'm here for the long run. I'm here to see it through. I'm here. Like Jacob was there and said, God, I'm not letting you go until I get the answer. I'm not letting you go until you bless me. I will not stop. I will not shut up. I will push in, stop pushing in because I know that you are in the process with me. I know that my breakthrough is available. <laughs> Let's push in during this song and believe God for a miracle. You're